Okay, so hi everybody, and uh, welcome to today's um, seminar from the um, University of Liverpool, Earth Science Research Group. I'm very pleased to welcome and introduce Dr. Catherine Annen. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Catherine. Uh, well, Catherine and I have known each other for, gosh, uh, more than a decade now. <laughs> um, but she's an earth scientist. She did her first degree at the University in Geneva. I think she didn't, um, then did a PhD in volcanology that was at Clement Ferrand and in Geneva, a joint uh, PhD. And then in 2000, she went to the University of Bristol and where she was doing a postdoc uh, with Steve Sparks. Then she went back to Geneva for a little while as a research and teaching position. Then back to Bristol again in 2009, that was for seven years, again to work with Steve. And then she got a Marie Curie Fellowship where she went to Chambéry University in France for a couple of years. So she is one of the super postdocs. <laughs> and, um, and now she is researcher at the Institute of Geophysics at the Czech Academy of Sciences um, since 2021. And it's a real pleasure to introduce her and to talk about some of her uh, latest research. Okay, Katrin, I will share the slides for you. Oh, it's disappeared. That's great. It's okay. Just smile and pretend it's all fine. There we go. <laughs> okay, over to you, Katrin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. So um, today I'm going to speak about uh, magma chamber, uh, how they are formed and how they, they fail and uh, feed, might feed an uh, eruption. And I'm going to focus on, on magma chamber in the upper crust. I'm not going to, to speak about deeper uh, reservoir and mostly on silicic magma chamber also, we will make a few incursions in the more mafic uh, world. So, um, if we are interested in uh, volcanology and eruption uh, and how it relates with magma chamber, um, if we uh, uh, we interest we are interested in in magma ch in uh, eruptions that are fed by shallow magma chamber. Uh, then we, we first need a magma chamber that contain enough melt to feed the eruption, obviously. And second thing, we need uh, a way to fracture the magma chamber's wall. And then we need a dike that propagate uh, to the surface. So today I will just um, cover the, the two first points. I'm not going to, to speak about uh, dike propagation. But uh, the problem we have is that we don't really know what a magma chamber is and what, uh, how it looks. Um, and we have um, a series of different uh, models that generally depend on the discipline uh, in which we are, we are working. Yeah. And one of the very simple uh, model of magma chamber is what we can call the the lollipop magma chamber, which is basically a sphere uh, fed by a conduit. And this is very useful uh, to develop uh, mathematical uh, analysis equations. Um, and it's useful, but clearly magma chamber are very unlikely to, to have this geometry. And then it depends. Some people uh, see um, it's more in the granitic uh, world uh, chamber or magma bodies that are very uh, elongated uh, vertically or uh, petrologists uh, have sometimes uh, a concept of magma chamber that is a little bit uh, potato uh, shaped sort but it doesn't really matter because uh, it's, it's when you do uh, petrology you 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 more you're not really interested with the, in the 3D uh, aspect of your chamber. And then there are this, uh, these models uh, that uh, see magma chamber as a series of, uh, of uh, dikes and seal and that formed by the accumulation 
of this uh, uh, successive batch of, uh, of magma. And um, I, will, I will show you why I think uh, this is the most uh, likely, in my opinion, uh, shape of magma chamber. Um, and uh, it's matter. it matters for two reasons, the geometry. It matters because the heat transfer is not just, it depends on the geometry of the chamber, it depends on the ratio of the surface uh, to the volume. And it also matters for the mechanic, for the stability, mechanical stability of the chamber. So uh, relatively uh, briefly, uh, I've just reviewed a few arguments for uh, magma chamber uh, being formed by the accumulation of high aspect ratio uh, intrusion. And one of is this compilation by Cruden and uh, McCaffrey uh, that shows that uh, many uh, granitic uh, plutons uh, have a high aspect ratio, they have tabular uh, uh, shape or uh, funnel shape. And um, if we look at uh, magmatic bodies that are close to the surface, um, we, we can see, uh, we have example where we can see in the field uh, that is clearly uh, an accumulation uh, of seals. Uh, that's an example. That's another example in Chile where, where we see the, the limit, the boundary between, with, between the successive uh, seals. And this is my favorite example. I think it's also Jenny favorite example. Um, this is Torres del Paine, which is a really um, exceptional sort of uh, uh, granite body where we can see both the, the upper and the lower limit of, the, of, of this uh, body of granite. And this was thought for a very long time to be a, a, sing, a single lacquer that was rapidly on place in one shot, but more um, detailed study uh, showed later that it's actually composed of three, uh, three units uh, with uh, distinctive uh, edges. And uh, even each of these units uh, appear to be formed by a succession of thinner uh, seals. And this, well, this is more in the mafic world. This is uh, uh, in Iceland where uh, we have this uh, outcrop of what has been uh, called the flower lacolith. And here again, uh, it can be seen that it's, it's uh, feeder dikes. It's dikes that uh, change their orientation uh, to form seals uh, that accumulate to form a bigger body. And um, went to the to the um, the work of the uh, uh, laboratory experimentalists like Janine here, or like the student here, or like <laughs> Thierry Manon, which is uh, a paper from uh, the, the, the figure from, from from him. We 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 have a good physical understanding on how it can work when you have this, uh, so I won't explain this to you, you know better than me, but when you have this uh, feeder dike that is uh, either uh, meeting uh, um, a rigidity boundary and spread uh, horizontally or change or the change of stress uh, also um, makes these dikes change their orientation. And this, if we repeat the process, we, we end up uh, with building uh, a bigger magma body. So that's, that's the basis for the modeling I have been uh, uh, developing for quite uh, some time now. Uh, it's very simple model, very basic. And the principle is that uh, I have a numerical uh, grid with uh, each cell of this grid as a temperature, a melt fraction. Um, in the most recent uh, model, they have also a dissolved and exalt uh, water content. 
uh, and also a series of pa a useful parameters for the computation, like uh, uh, density, conducti thermal conductivity, etc. And each time I want to model the emplacement of, uh, of magma in, th in this example, uh, and what follows this uh, succession of seals, I just set the corresponding cell in my uh, grid to, to, the to the characteristic of a, of, a, of a magma. So high temperature, high, high melt fraction, and so on. And then I calculate the diffusion of, um, of uh, of heat with, um, with the, the diffusion equation here, so that I, I, I recalculate for each time step the temperature in my, in my grid and the corresponding melt fraction. And then I repeat the, the process to uh, model the, the, the growth of a, of a body. And this is a sort of uh, result uh, I obtain. So I do the calculation on the half domain here. So that's, that's it here. And this is successive uh, silts here at the beginning. You see, I, I have already on place two silts. This is the, the melt fraction in the system. The yellow uh, color is where you have uh, liquid magma and uh, the corresponding temperature here. So what you see is this succession of seals and uh, accumulation of, uh, of melt in the system. And in this model, I will I stop after having on place two the thickness of two kilometer uh, of seals, and then I leave, the, I leave it uh, cool down and temperature relax. Uh, so maybe I can accelerate a little bit. The, the point, the interesting point is I end up, I start with high aspect ratio seal and I end up with something that is quite spherical because of the way uh, heat is diffusing. So that was when I was, uh, that's what I obtained was when I on place one 200 meter seal every 200 years. So I build up a two kilometer thick body in 2000 uh, year, which is very rapid from a geological point of view. So now that's what happened. If I do exactly the same thing, nothing changed. The only uh, difference is uh, that instead of uh, waiting for 200 years between two seals, now I wait for 2000 years. And what happened in this case is my seals completely solidify uh, before the next one uh, is on place. And it's going to be on place at 2000 year. You have the time at the top. Okay, so that's, that's the next one. And again, it will completely uh, crystallize before, during the period between two um, seal on placement. But you can see here that the temperature uh, keep uh, increasing in the system. And as a consequence, each of my seal here, we need a little bit more time to completely uh, solidify as the system uh, is maturing. So that uh, at a certain point, you, we will keep um, melt in the system between uh, two seals injection. And that should happen soon. Yes, you see. Now I have placed a new, new one and a little bit of melt was, uh, was uh, still there in the system. So this period of time before, uh, during which we completely uh, solidify, we, we have called it the, the incubation time. And now we are growing a body of, of mush of uh, uh, mostly uh, composed of uh, of crystal, but with some melt, and the, the melt part is is getting uh, bigger uh, and bigger. But it's still much smaller than it was when we were doing it much more rapidly. So if I accelerate a little bit, you see this chamber evolving, and then yeah, okay. So that's that's the maximum size it's going to reach and then it crystallize and okay 
that's finished by. So my point here is that you have this incubation time before you, you, you start growing a magma chamber. And this uh, incubation time depends on the uh, on placement rate of the, of, the, of the magmatic body, which is, and it's one dimension because um, most of the heat is lost at the top and the bottom of, of the system. No, and not much on the side. And you can, so this is an analysis by uh, Michou and Jopa, who said exactly that, that the, this is the, the, the incubation time and this is the, at what rate you grow as a system. But you, you can see it perfectly on, a, on the numerical simulation. This is the result of my numerical simulation. Each of the symbol is a, is a simulation, but uh, some of the simulation is, are with a radius for the seal of five kilometer, and some are for, our, for a radius of 10 kilometer. And it's really start to make a, a difference uh, when we have a very high uh, uh, emplacement rate. So the point is that Generating or not a magma chamber depends on the thickening rate of the, of the body. But uh, if you do it fast enough to generate a magma chamber, then the volume of the magma chamber will also depend on the radius. So it will depend on the flux. So the flux doesn't tell you if you make a magma chamber, it, it tells you if you make a big magma chamber or a small magma chamber. And so I calculated uh, which uh, flux uh, are needed to, to make a magma chamber that will be uh, big enough to feed a super eruption. And that's what this diagram is showing. So we, 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 we call super eruption uh, eruptions that are uh, no more than 450 uh, cubic kilometer. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the magma flux in, in cubic kilometer per year. And uh, I find that uh, I need of the order of 10 to the minus two cubic kilometer per year to generate one of these uh, giant eruption. And you can do it a little bit more rapidly if you have a, um, a magma that has a lower uh, solidus that produce uh, um, the same uh, more melt uh, at lower temperature, but you, you will still be uh, somewhere around around here. And we compared that with uh, data compiled from uh, by the Saint Blanca et al on, uh, on mostly plutonic rocks. Uh, and this is this is the volume of a, of a plutons. And this is um, estimated time of uh, assembly of this pluton. And this is log, uh, we are on log log uh, scale, so it's, it's not very accurate. But the point is um, that this, uh, this line here give us uh, the flux of, uh, to, to grow the, the plutons. And um, this flux, uh, for most of the of this body is uh, this is a 10 minus two line where uh, I put the limit to grow uh, a very big magma chamber and we see that most of this uh, rectangle are located uh, at lower uh, magma fluxes not all but most of them which suggests that many of these plutons uh, were not a very big magma chamber but then we have to be careful with that because it's based mostly on the duration here is based mostly on zircon uh, uh, edges and i'm not going to have time to to show it but we have some suspicion that the zircon are not actually um, dating the emplacement uh, of the pluton and they might be dating a process at a uh, in deeper reservoir so this is to take uh, caref carefully. Okay. 
And what this suggests is that we have that pluton that seems to be on place at a very at a, a low flux, but we also have uh, super eruptions that exist. So it's it suggests that occasionally we have very high flux of magma to 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 form this very large magma chamber to feed this very large eruption. And if we look at uh, in the literature, um, the um, diffusion, uh, element diffusion in crystals, um, the disequilibrium of the of profile of element in, in, uh, in crystal suggests that uh, uh, these crystal have very short residence time in the, in the magma of the order of, this is be shopped off uh, a few hundred to a few thousand years. And it's the uh, same for Tau and it's even short of uh, the mineral uh, eruption in Santorini. And that corresponds to fluxes that are uh, very high, 10 to the minus, uh, several 10 to the minus one cubic kilometer per year. So it's, it's consistent uh, with what we, we were uh, seeing uh, earlier of, the, of this need of uh, high flux to generate this, this big magma chamber. And it's where I'm. It's where I'm going to do a little uh, incursion in the mafic world. This is a, a recent uh, work we did uh, with uh, Rice Latipov on the Skergard um, intrusion in Greenland, and here the petrologists are uh, convinced. Um, at least the petrologists that are working on Skergard are convinced that uh, this. Uh, bodies, this large mafic intrusion of Skergard was uh, was a big uh, a big tank of magma uh, when it started to crystallize. And the reason for that is a uh, is that the um, evolution of uh, the mineral uh, assemblage from the bottom, uh, from the top, and from the wall towards the surface. And uh, also the evolution of the uh, anorthic content in, in plagioclase all uh, suggests that it grows from, from the size, from all the size towards the center simultaneously. And the only way to, to do that, it seems, is to crystallize something that is completely molten uh, on, from all sides at the, at the same time. So I, I ran the numerical simulation to, to try to find out uh, what sort of uh, emplacement rate we were needing, needing uh, to, to get this crystal poor uh, magma at the end uh, of the emplacement. So what are the conditions so that uh, each batch of magma doesn't crystallize before the next one uh, arrives? So it corresponds to an incubation time of zero, basically. And we can uh, do this uh, with only with very high uh, emplacement rate of the, and that corresponds to uh, to the emplacement of this. Uh, it's 280 cubic kilometer, and we 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 will need to to emplace this in a few centuries uh, at most. So this is really a very uh, exceptional type, catastrophic type of. Uh, event in the in the intrusive world. Okay, so that was about uh, making a magma chamber. So now what about uh, breaking a magma chamber? How do we uh, fracture the wall of magma chamber in order to, to feed a, a, an eruption? And we have a, a series of uh, hypotheses about that. Um, the most Probably the most popular uh, is it's uh, overpressure due to new magma input, the addition of volume that uh, creates a pressure that will fracture the wall of the magma chamber. Uh, we have also the uh, uh, hypothesis that it's cooled due to second boiling, volatile exolution as the magma chamber start to crystallize that add volumes uh, again to the chamber and, um, and make it uh, uh, crack. And then we, we will uh, discuss a little bit about magma buoyancy 
and I didn't put it in, but most importantly about volatile variancy. And um, another hypothesis that I, I'm not going to discuss today is the idea of the surface, surface deformation can generate fractures that then propagate towards the, the magma chamber. But there are uh, several factors to take into account if we want to understand that. One is the rheology of the wall rocks, and the other is the geometry and size uh, of, the, of the chamber. So we, we're back to this problem of geometry. Regarding the rheology of the wall rocks, um, if uh, we have a, an elastic uh, wall rock, then uh, the pressure is not relaxed. Um, and what is important uh, to, to know uh, for the, the rupture is the volume, uh, the volume that is added, added to, to, to the system. Now, if the wall rocks are viscoelastic, then you, we have some relaxation of, uh, of pressure. And the, the fact that the, the wall rock can break or not uh, depends on the balance between the, the relaxation time and the, uh, the, the time scale of uh, on placement of the volume increase. So in one case, it's a volume per se, and in the other uh, case, it's a rate of uh, volume increase. So that's from a, a paper, quite famous paper by uh, Jelinek and De Paolo. And we are back to the lollipop uh, magma chamber because uh, they have done uh, a mani um, mathematical uh, analysis of the overpressure in the magma in the magma chamber. And they have treated the case of a viscoelastic uh, crust. And the analysis um, shows that the maximum pressure in the magma chamber depend on the viscosity of the wall rock, the flux uh, in the magma chamber and the volume and in, uh, in uh, inverse proportion of the volume of the, of the magma chamber. And the consequence of this uh, equation here is that if we have a small magma chamber here, small volume, and a cold, cold country rock with a high viscosity here, then the magma chamber will systematically uh, fail. If we start a, a, a proto-magma chamber, then it, will, it has to fail uh, with each new uh, magma uh, input. But on the contrary, if we have now a, 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 a very big magma chamber, caldera super eruption type magma chamber, in a mature crust with uh, low viscosity here and high volume here, we, we will never be able to, to, to make it crack um, uh, by, by uh, adding volume. So that's, that's uh, asked two questions. Well, how do we start a magma chamber? And then once we, we have made make a, a, a big one, how do we make an eruption out of it? And I think the first question is relatively easy to answer because the point is that magma chamber, as we saw, are probably not uh, this sphere. But if they are, uh, as we suspect, uh, starting as silts, then uh, when you had new magma, the, the, they will uh, crack at the, at the tips. So we will uh, increase the size of the magma chamber uh, laterally. Now, how do we erupt a, a very a big one? The answer uh, that has been uh, proposed by several uh, authors, Kariki et al. and Malfe et al., is that it's uh, the buoyancy that is now the, the, the source of the pressure. No, buoyancy is the difference in density multiplied by the, the, the height of the, of the magma chamber. And Malfe et al. have calculated that with a few kilometers, we start to have a pressure that uh, excess, exceeds uh, the strength of the rock. Now, what I have been uh, interested uh, in recently is the role of, uh, of volatiles. And it's not 
uh, straightforward to calculate the pressure due to the exhalation of volatiles if we don't if we want to consider a, a, a chamber that is not spherical that is a little bit more realistic than that and uh, uh, with gradient of uh, melt fraction and gradient of temperature gradient of uh, viscosity in the system so what what we we did we we had a, another approach with we thought okay uh, if it's um, um, second boiling, the volatiles are carried by the magma itself. So the volatiles pressure cannot be treated independently from the, from the magma pressure. And so what we did is just uh, to evaluate the role of volatiles, uh, uh, the volume of volatiles added to the to the chamber in comparison to the volumes added to the chamber by the magma. And um, just a word about uh, how it looks. This is these are the temperatures that uh, from a, a growing magma chamber. So as before, this is a, the beginning, the, the first seal. Um, this is at the end of the emplacement of the magma. So we have this magma chamber here at the core that is surrounded uh, by a, 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 a thermal aureole. And then we, we crystallize and solidify the, the chamber and that's the state of the temperature. And when we have the temperature, we can look at the, at the viscosity of the of the country rock, so we have a, a strong evol marked evolution of viscosity around uh, the magma chamber as the system uh, matures and the magma body grows, which results in an evolution in the relaxation time. And here, this is a, a log a log ten of relaxation time, so very close to to the magma chamber here. We have relaxation time of 100 years, but as soon as we get a little bit further away, we 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 very rapidly have a, a relaxation time of 10 to the to the eight uh, years, which is which means that the the, the cross is actually elex elastic; it doesn't relax at all. But now, if we let the system uh, grow and mat mature. We, we can have a relatively low uh, relaxation time, relatively uh, far away from, from the magma chamber. Now the 100 year is here and here we have 10,000 10, years. So first, if we consider uh, uh, the beginning of the, of the process with a magma chamber that, it, that has not have had time to, to hit its uh, environment. Um, then uh, what's in, important is how much volume is added to the, to the, to the system. And what this diagram uh, are showing, this is results of my numerical simulation. So this is the magma that is, uh, the volumes of magma that is injected uh, in the chamber. Part of it crystallize, so this is in red, the uh, eruptible uh, magma, what, what, it, what has not uh, solidified. So we stop on placing magma here uh, and then it solidifies, so we decrease. And in blue here, this is um, the volume of, uh, in this case, uh, water that is exhaled by the system. And this is exactly the same thing, but in, um, in a relative term, it's uh, the volume of water relative to the volume here of uh, magma that has been injected. And you see that the maximum is ab about uh, 30, it's, it's one third, the, the volume of volatile represents one third of the volume uh, of the magma. And my point is, is if the magma that has been uh, carried, that, that was carrying these volatiles didn't trigger uh, an eruption. There is no reason that the volatiles will trigger this eruption because the volume is, is, uh, is only one third of the volume of the magma. So what they can do is add some pressure to a, a already pressurized uh, pressure system 
So they might be the, the last thing we needed to, to break the chamber, but they are not the, the main uh, cause of pressure increase. And the other point uh, is that um, we es expect the system to be elastic at the beginning of the emplacement of the magma. But at this uh, point, we, we are below, we are in, during the incubation time and we don't have, the, um, we don't have magma, uh, a lot of mobile magma in the system. Okay, now if we are in a viscoelastic uh, environment, then what is important is the rates of, uh, of uh, volume increase. And if we are in, um, in the magma chamber that's formed by addition of the seal, we can uh, identify two, two rates. One is the average rate here, that will be this red line uh, that um, integrate the, the repose period between two injection. And this rate is much slower than the rate of uh, emplacement of one uh, single batch of magma. And the, the single batch of magma, if the, if the magma chamber is fed by a, by a DAC, is controlled by the, um, the solidification of the DAC. And that's what this diagram show here. It's from uh, 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 Menon et al. It shows that uh, we have calculated here the, the minimum uh, flux in a, in a dike so that the dike does not solidify uh, and, and freeze. And the minimum of the minimum, this is a, a Monte Carlo simulation with uh, many variation in, in parameter, but the minimum of all the minimum, it's 10 to the minus one cubic kilometer uh, per year. So now if we look at um, the rate of uh, the increase in volume due to the, to the volatile, this is uh, the, this blue, here's this, this blue line. So you have this big variation because it corresponds to the emplacement of the successive seals. And you see the, um, the scale here. We are very, very far from the oh, 10 minus one of the of our, um, of our die. So we will, we will always be much below the flux of one single uh, dike. But if you, we consider the long-term uh, average magma influx rate, then at the beginning of the simulation, we, we, we have a rate of exolution that are comparable to the, to the rate of magma input. So in this case, uh, at this point in time, uh, we can uh, say that the, the, the pressure uh, induce the overpressure due to the to solution is as important as the overpressure due to the to the magma input, except that at this point we don't have magma anywhere in the magma chamber. That's the first uh, point, and the second point we we have seen that at this point in the in the growth of the magma chamber we are more. Uh, more likely, likely to be in the elastic uh, domains and in the viscoelastic one. And what happened is that this rate here decreased very rapidly. And the reason why is that as the system evolved in temperature, the cooling, um, the cooling rate decreased uh, because the gradient in temperature decreased. So that the solidification rate decreased, so that the exolution rate also decreased, and it's, it's just all controlled by uh, by the, the by heat transfer. But you could tell me, and you will be right, that this uh, magma input rate is an input of the of the of the model, and uh, so I can I can change it, change it, and if I change it, if I go to a much lower uh, input magma input rate, then in this case, the exolution rate here is comparis, comparis, uh, it's the same as the uh, magma input rate, except that it's not relevant because at this rate, I'm, I'm not generating a magma chamber. It's, it's everything solidified. 
And if I go for a high uh, uh, input rate, that will be this case, then I I'm generating a lot of magma here, but my exolution rate is very low just because the system is too hot, it's not cooling, so it's not exolving water. So my, uh, my conclusion here is that the, the volatile is unlikely to be, the, again, the main trigger of, a, of an eruption. And it's always the same reasoning. If the magma itself doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, fracture the, the rocks, there is no reason why the volatiles will do it. But it's not the end of the story because then um, we have the, the buoyancy effect. And we, we did some modelization, the extremely simple modelization of water transfer uh, that uh, are based on the, um, on the paper of Parmigiani uh, et al. And the idea is that if you exolve uh, water uh, within the liquid part of the magma chamber, so where you would have little bubbles suspended in the, in the magma, this bubble, we are at two kilobar here, and these bubbles are very small. They are a few uh, micron in, uh, in diameter. So the, the buoyancy is actually very extremely, extremely low. And um, we can calculate the velocity as a function of how many crystal around there are to, to preclude movement. And we find that it's just a few um, tens or hundreds of, uh, of mic micron per year. So we consider that they are, they are not actually moving in the, in the model. But in contrast, according uh, again to, to Parmigiani uh, et al, when you are in the mush part of the magma chamber, where you have a framework of, uh, of crystals that occupy the, the space, then you form, they find that you form, uh, uh, you connect the, the bubbles of, uh, of uh, water, you form channel. And in this case, the, the water can ascend very rapidly through this mush until it hits a, a solid boundary. And the velocity is several centimeters per year. So at the scale of, the, of our model, this is uh, just not moving. And this is uh, instantaneous transport to, towards uh, the roof of the chamber. And this is, again, a numerical simulation. We grow magma chamber. This is a melt here. And this is a water. When, when it's all, all uh, uh, white, that means there is no melt. And here is, a, is the water content. And what you, you see here, I already had one seal on place. It has completely solidified. No, no melt is left, but the, the water get up when it was in a mush state and accumulate a layer at the top of, of the seal. And that's how it works. You have these successive seals and now you, you, you have a magma chamber with mush around and the, the, you have layers of, uh, of uh, water forming around around the, 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 the chamber in the mush part of the chamber that then get trapped as uh, magma uh, solidify. And then we get quite speculative. We don't really know what's happening with this water. And one of the limitation of this simulation, as I said, it's, it's a very simple one, is that we don't uh, really are uh, able to model what's going on when we have more than 50 volume percent of water. So we just stop uh, simulating the, the, the water transfer in this case. And we end up with this multiple layers uh, of water, uh, water rich layer. But in nature, most probably this uh, water exolution will, will uh, induce uh, pressure at the very local uh, state and, and induce some uh, micro fracturation in our system. And I think it's not unreasonable to think that this layer, water rich layer will connect and form a bigger layer 
uh, at the top of the, of the system. And if this is the case, then if we accumulate uh, the water at the top of the mush, then we can calculate the buoyancy uh, of this water layer. And the, the buoyancy, which is here, is very high. And it's very high simply because the density of the water is very low compared to the density of the rock around. So this is density of the water, and this is the density of the magma itself. And we see now that we are really above. So uh, we have, in this case, uh, the, the force added by the water is, is uh, very significant compared to, to, to the magma. But of course, it's all depend if we lose the water or not, if we are able to concentrate it, if we, so it's all about the respective permeability of the mush and the, the solid rock uh, around. So we can make uh, some hypothesis if we have a, a system uh, where the country rock has, a, has some permeability and the, the gas uh, can ex escape, then nothing will happen in terms of eruption. We will just have passive degassing uh, at the surface. Now, if we, we can trap the, 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 the layer, of, uh, layer of water in our system, but this layer completely decoupled from, from the magma, either because it's separated from the magma by this layer of, uh, of mush, or because we don't have magma at all because it's, uh, it's just all solidifying, then we would expect in, uh, to see a burst of, uh, of degassing, deformation at the surface, and some, bradi some um, bradyseismic uh, crisis, as we saw uh, in uh, the Campi, Campi Flegrei. And the last case is if we accumulate the, the, the water, if the mush is sufficiently permeable, but the country rock is not permeable. And we have, we form a connection uh, between the, I mean, we, 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 we crack the rock and, and then the, the fracture propagates down in the magma chamber, then we will erupt both the, the liquid magma and a lot of crystal, because we have all those crystal between the, the water and, and, the, and the magma chamber. And that might be a case of uh, mobilization of, uh, of a mush, and we would expect um, a lot of deformation in surface and then eruption with a very crystal rich, rich eruption. So if I, if I summarize, um, the growth of magma chamber is uh, by addition of seals is controlled by the, the velocity of thickening of this uh, uh, body. Uh, large magma chambers require very high exceptional uh, magma fluxes, but it happened because we have this big eruption. But most plutons might never have been large magma chambers. And the pressure due to volatile X solution is unlikely to be the main trigger, the main source of uh, overpressure uh, for eruption. Um, if it's, we look only at the volume, but if we look at the uh, buoyancy, they might uh, play a very important role. And uh, uh, magma recharge explain uh, small eruptions. Magma buoyancy explain large eruption and volatile buoyancy would explain a crystal rich eruption. So I'm done, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Any questions from the audience? <laughs> I don't really know how to do the questions, but um, yeah, Dan, you want to go first? Uh, but, and Catherine, maybe you can repeat the question for the Zoom. <laughs> that was a lovely talk. Yeah, so you started off by saying, or considering that the, the, the magma chambers uh, produced from uh, the, the injection of cells, 
Uh, but the spacing of those cells stays the same in the model too. And you talked a little bit later about the, you know, the, the, um, I guess the breakage of the, 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 the boundary chamber, um, you know, it's related to the viscosity of the wall rock. So I wonder whether the thermal evolution you showed in the first models, that you've got that will, will control the spacing of the injection of the cells as well. Um, and that, you know, there'll be a, a point, I guess, where if you allow the heat to build up, the, the viscosity of the wall rock will be uh, a little bit lower, and that will that will change the spacing of the, the next cell that will come in too. So I just wondered how that would work. Or what did, you know, yes, did you yes. No, no, that's, that's absolutely, it's a very good question to see. Um, so it's about uh, the evolution of temperature and then the evolution of viscosity in the crop tree work will affect how uh, frequent or how big are the successive uh, batch of magma. And I'm quite confident it does. I don't, but I don't model it because it's very simple models that don't take into to account the variation in uh, in the rheology of the of the country work, but uh, I think in the real world it's actually play a role. And th there have been some I don't remember the reference now, but some uh, I think it's couched on some work done with but with spherical chamber where you have a devolution in temperature uh, of the country work around the, ch the chamber and and it acts on the well, it's yes, it's temperature, rheology evolve, and then the, the the stress field evolve, and this stress field uh, act as uh, attracting uh, dikes towards uh, the the chamber, so that it makes the chamber grows more rapidly with with, with time. But uh, I think there is probably quite. Uh, interesting feedback to model here but it has not been done yet and actually what is very interesting is for example we we ran a numerical simulation for Torres del Paine by looking at uh, this different how fast we can uh, build the different units and uh, based on also on the um, zircon age and the evidence is, is that you, you, you have a, a, a fast emplacement and then you stop for a very long time. And then you have again a fast emplacement and then you stop. So I think my conviction is that it's actually uh, highly irregular. But to model it, we, we, don't, we still don't have the model to, to do it, but that's, that's a future development set. That's really interesting. I mean, you can always put more complexity into the model. So always. You know, <laughs> you use a little bit of the insight you have there, so it's, mm -hmm. so it's, it's nice to be in the same mm -hmm. place. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, I have a question. I, I worked in a model of uh, fluids and how they work in the mother chamber, and uh, if I understood it correctly, you said that, you know, clearly a two kilobyte you have you know the tiny all time bubbles and they remain separated through the very not known different bodies but you also postulated that it's likely that they actually channel and form connected mm. structures and you also you know showed an image that you know i like that showed this layer of fluid um, within the magma chamber or the top of the what they want to part i was wondering you know you said that's likely to happen in nature. I was wondering what did you base this statement on? Is there any evidence of this in nature? Well, the evidence we have uh, for accumulation of water is, is in, I think in, in, well, I, I don't think, I was told in the Torres del, del, del Paine, I haven't seen it, I would like to see it, but there are apparently cavities at the top of the, of the body that, uh, that would have been generated by the uh, by the presence of water, and I saw it's in the Yosemite. I think they, they have also this sort of evidence for water, but we need to have water at some point because we 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 know that there is water in magma. I think the big question is what is happen happening to this water once it has been exhaled and. The other type of evidence we we have, but it's really 
depends how it is interpreted, is from geophysics, where there are this burst of uh, little earthquakes that could be attributed to, to, to water going up. And also um, uh, on the electrical uh, conductivity tomography, there are things that could be water, but it's always cooled because, you know, it's, there is always several possible interpretation. So we can't really put our finger on it, but yeah, we can just say likely. Yes, there's, there's, there, there are a few experiments where they see this, uh, this channeling progressing in a um, sort of granular materials. It's really uh, fingers. Um, what do you think in your experience about uh, the mineral stress field as an extra factor uh, for creating large volcanic eruptions? Because in the Andes, there are a lot of people working um, so, know, 10 years ago um, in the relationship between huge earthquakes and seismic eruptions like um, the 1960 Virginia earthquake. In both cases, uh, there were two uh, increases, in, increases in the seismic activity in the So, is this case question about if there is a relationship between uh, tectonically induced? Seismicity and Maybe then eruption. An extra factor for, for example, uh, not just thinking about volatiles uh, in, instead of this, like combining uh, the rock. Yeah, my, my feeling is um, if you have a system when you, you have all this water, it's, it's, a, it's a system that is. Uh, unstable you know because because of the buoyancy and it might be that when you have a seism it will be the it will be destabilize the system it it has been hypothesized i, I think it's gutsman uh, uh and collaborator who wrote a paper about uh, this possibility of the of the uh, of seism uh, uh triggering the the eruption, but it, it's not it's not fitting too well my story because in in that case they kind of have a, the argument is that the, the 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 magma is poor in water and thus it must be the safe that provokes the trigger the eruption. But I suppose if you have both, it's even better. But I don't know, I really don't know if we have examples of that, if we have arguments. So um, you talked about water and, and uh, the effect of uh, dissolving water, but there are lots of different volatiles in magmas and if you have one phase dissolving, you often have others as well. So why water? Uh, particularly, and would it matter how much difference would it maybe make if it were a different volatile that you looked at, or if it were a mixed mixture? Yeah, we, we looked at water because we are at uh, two kilobar, and in theory, the, the um, CO2 must have already been exhaled at a lower level, the, the saturation. Uh, should happen at uh, lower levels. So I understand that water is really dominant. And yes, the other one in, in terms, if we really look at the, at the volume that is added, it's, it's, they are not significant in this type of magma at this depth. Did you say that the magma is talking about high deep aggregate? 
Uh, a little bit less. We we are between yes six and seven kilometers, yeah. and it's it's quite common uh, in experimental petrology. They find commonly that it's it's where their crystal assemblage must have formed before the eruption, and it's also where I had data to 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 parameterize the, the model. Um, I think if, if, if I, one, one thing I would like to do is to try the same sort of simulation with different depths, different uh, water contents, that will be a follow up. Um, but the two kilo bar seems to be where the majority of magma chamber will be, the last one. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, any questions from YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> we had some people watching. <laughs> okay. Great. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.